Welcome to the Craftsman USA Ratchet History Project. Welcome back to the Craftsman USA Ratchet History Project. Before you we have what I've dubbed the Intermediate Ratchets. Within my timeline that I've set up for the series, these are the second and third generation raised panel hybrids. There's a mathematician that I'm going to take a, a quote from. It's Benoit Mendelbrot, the individual who noticed fractal geometry, the geometric patterns that repeat infinitely. I would recommend you read a little bit about him if, if you're interested in that. Very cool stuff. He says that there's a saying that every nice piece of work needs the right person in the right place at the right time. And from the perspective of Mendelbrot, he didn't believe that he necessarily discovered fractal geometry. He said it already existed. I'm just somebody that noticed it. And these ratchets would fit within that category. If there is anything that I've con offered or contributed to in the world of craftsman ratchet history, this is my achievement <laughs> in that regard. It's not necessarily the fact that I did anything amazing, it's just that I, I got lucky and I noticed an anomaly within the families. I'm sure that there are plenty of people out there that that have long owned these ratchets or you know or formally owned them they, they just bought them, used them as a tool and moved on with life but within the communities they didn't really seem to be an acknowledgement of the ratchets that you see before you and their existence. Even Alloy Artifacts, which is an amazing tool resource, has nothing on this. And even some of my other really significant sources didn't discuss these at all. A lot of people that I spoke with thought that what you see before you was basically this right here. This is the one of the contributors to the second generation. I call this the long lever because the lever is pretty long and look at that beefcake. I think <laughs> I should call this the high profile lever more like it but uh, amongst most community members they called this the long lever and, it, and the lever really is a, a tad bit longer than the the ratchets that you see before you or the ones that came after it. So. It's like a big giant pimple compared to, say for example, the, the third gen. Look at that. <laughs> Pretty big. But nonetheless, that was where these realistically sat within the minds of those that collected them or were just aware of the, the, the variety of different ratchets within the history. So what makes these special is that they are an incremental step just before generation three. So here we've got a gen three example. This would have been the very first rendition of that. We've got a, a 1967 variant before us. There might have been a handful, you know, of, if you follow that type study that I mentioned before when we were talking about Gen 3, uh, the quick releases, uh, there might have been a couple of different stampings, maybe a half a year beforehand, but realistically, in terms of the, the raw grand scale changes that really doesn't play a big part in anything, uh, these were just before that point. We'll go ahead and run through our traditional uh, biography of information and then we'll dive into what I think was going on at the point in time with Sears and the Craftsman brand. So you could find this trio of ratchets first offered in the 1967 Sears catalog. We've got quarter inch at $3.18, 
we've got three quarter inch, or I should say three eighths, <laughs> at three dollars and ninety three cents, and half inch at five dollars and nineteen. They were last offered in the nineteen sixty nine Sears catalog. Quarter inch at three ninety nine, three eighths at four ninety nine, and half inch at six ninety nine. And that's not all you got. <laughs> Much like the Generation 3, you got the full gambit of what that generation offered within this series. So you're going to get those flex heads. You're going to get that 15 inch long, half inch breaker bar ratchet. Let's go ahead and take a look. So here we have that flex head half inch mine isn't in the the best shape but you know what this is an original I'm very pleased with that so the flex head was offered the half inch was offered in 1967 as well at seven dollars and four cents before you we have a three-eighths very pretty good condition and that was offered for four dollars and eighty six cents kind of a weird price point there but so we got half inch at 704 and three-eighths at 486 now what about that 15 inch half inch drive breaker bar we got that too right before you and this thing is in amazing condition this was donated to me by someone that used to repair organs church organs <laughs> and it seems like the Holy Spirit must have touch this ratchet along with the other goodies that he sent me because <laughs> it must have had divine protection to to basically have it be a new condition so we're really really fortunate to have this example at all that first made its appearance also in 1967 at $6.64 and the final price like all the other flex heads and standard versions in 1969 last offering for seven dollars and ninety nine cents the half inch ratchets whether it's the the fifteen inch breaker bar half inch drive the half inch flex the half inch standard those sported a thirty two tooth gear with a two tooth engagement per side offering eleven point two five degrees of arc swing the other sizes only have 24 teeth. So a quarter inch, three eighths, 24 teeth, two tooth engagement per side, 15 degrees of arc swing. That was the same exact phenomenon that you found within the Flying V ratchet series. And kind of sort of the same idea as we found in the, in the long head, um, also part of generation two. Uh, Longhead had, <laughs> had some schizophrenia going on because we had 40 inch gear for half inch. Actually, I ended up making a small error in the uh, description of the 3 eighths for that particular set because that actually had a 32 tooth gear. That's crazy. It's bonkers. And the other one had, the quarter inch had a 24 tooth gear. So, yeah, we got schizophrenia going on with that set, but this set very much follows the same exact gear pattern for each respective size as the Flying V and actually as Gen 3 right after it, the quick release. So these ratchets are made of molybdenum steel alloy with the nickel chrome plating, offers high corrosion, tarnish, and wear resistance. They're drop forged to increase strength at points of stress. Then heat treat to oil quench and temper to uniformly hard and prevent interior soft spots. And they were part of the Super Tough Steel line. These were made by Moore Drop Forge. And they represent an intermediate incremental improvement over the versions found within the second generation. So that would include 
the flying V slash butterfly selector ratchet, the long lever ratchet the, with the ridiculously high profile. It's not a full generation jump. And we, I have a working theory about that. So the issue with the long lever, for example, when it first came out, as I shared in the video that contained in this, there were there were some pretty big jumps in technology versus the first generation box head ratchet wrench. Uh, those followed a more contemporary design of the ratchet body overall. However, it offered the low gear to pull tooth engagement more traditional for ratchets that came during the World War II era and below versus what we would find moving up. This was a really radical jump offering all sorts of fancy machining, you know, again for Craftsman Ratchet. A lot of attention was done to the head. It's more rounded, nicer polish. Chrome was a little, uh, I guess was okay and strength was pretty good but we had issues with access the the fine tooth was a significant jump ornamental machining all of which cost more money and plus we have the problem with the significantly high profile and very I should say fairly easy to break selector switch on these out of the the lot that I've had, I've had some pretty good luck when, when finding these or having them donated to me or purchasing them, but I've seen plenty where these are snapped off. Heck, actually, I, I think I did receive one in a lot that this was snapped off because there wasn't a lot of clearance in certain workspaces, and what else is going to happen? You're going to be trying to get the negotiating your ratchet to where it needs to go, and all that force is going to go punk. Access was a bit of an issue as it is here and the same could be said about the butterfly selector ratchet as well butterfly was fairly easy to damage had some access issues so more draft forge the creator of first gen and second gen needed to come up with a solution because it would give Sears a savings of money so we're seeing an incremental transition the long levers having some issues, despite what they were trying to do, it wasn't necessarily working out. So they go to, after two years of selling these things, they go to Flying V slash Butterfly. They, they get some of those things right. The clearance for access of maintenance is getting better. The chroming is getting a little bit better. Strength is getting a little bit better. But the selector is still getting banged up. It's not necessarily a user-friendly experience and these tools were meant to be put to work so they made the logical step of improving access reducing profile of the selector so you're not banging it up and having to replace it because it was all on Sears's dime because the craftsman guarantee was that it's guaranteed forever unless you showed egregious levels of abuse you could replace your ratchet for free or have it repaired and those repair kits cost money too. So let's go ahead and just examine one of these. And you know what, I'm gonna grab Gen 3 just to show you for comparative purposes what we're, what we're dealing with here. So you can see that the access area the snap ring philosophy, or I should say the retention ring philosophy, is the exact same as Gen 3. Go ahead and flip it over. We've got the forged in the USA. That's more reminiscent of what you'd find on Gen 2. Otherwise, it's the same. It's the same exact idea. It just doesn't have the quick release. And why doesn't it have quick release? Well, Within the time frame that Moore Drop Forge was likely to be hashing what was to be this ratchet, quick release was being developed. 
by a very young Sears employee and Sears didn't buy the rights to the to the quick release yet. So this is what more Dropforge came up with, the next logical step in the evolutionary chain. Now The interesting thing about these ratchets, traditionally I show a repair kit. I don't have a repair kit for this set. And the reason I don't is because it's, it's kind of expensive to get one of these, realistically. You find re repair kit offerings at the same time as you would with the butterfly selector. Typically within this era, the early 60s, early to mid 60s I should say, this is when you start to see the appearance of these repair kits and typically the repair kits are hybrid repair kits. You might find the hourglass selector in there, you might find one of these low profile selector switches, you're gonna find the butterfly, so it's like a smorgasbord of different things per their respective sizes. So it's a bit of a bit of an expense for Sears but it's also nowadays a bit of an expense for the purchaser because typically these kits go for about sixty plus dollars a piece <laughs> and I don't need to I'm good I'm good you can uh, you can use your imagination I've already shown in the uh, second generation video an example of a printout where it shows both both uh, repair kits for their respective ratchets. So for these you have to use the low profile selector this was new for the time for these ratchets because you if you use say for example if you took one of these and put it on the butterfly or you took one of these and put it on the long lever it wouldn't function properly because you need that swing in order to in properly engage the gear comparing these two directly and I'll do this more so during the teardown video this has that kind of clearance to escape that hump these little spikes that are down below so if you put this on this guy it would work Low profile on long lever, not so much. You can't actuate your gear effectively. So we're kind of in a time where there's all sorts of stuff going on. <laughs> but logically this makes the most sense in terms of where we're moving, in terms of refining the design, refining the materials composition. Rather than making those selectors out of stainless steel, they're moving to molybdenum. They're stronger overall. They're not going to be spending all sorts of money or Sears as much on repair and warranty. So it's a positive thing. Now, these were sold in conjunction with the quick release. So, showing you an example of 1966's. Sears catalog offerings, it makes no reference to being able to buy a different design ratchet other than the butterfly selector. So we've got nothing going on there. Moving on to 1967, as I showed in the, the Gen 3 video, that's when we start to see the it says so here's the quick release the bottom box it says same as above but without quick release button so we have that 1967 same thing in 1968 same as above without quick release 1969 so you're seeing that these are kind of the same <laughs> when we go ahead and look at them. And this is actually the first and only formal acknowledgement of the of the intermediate, as I've called it, 
right here. It actually shows you, compared to the quick release, they uh, otherwise they never ever show it in any other shape or way or fashion. So, my hypothesis is that once Mr. Roberts, the, the creator of the quick release, had sold Sears their patent, they went straight away to quick release which kind of adds to the fire in regards to the lawsuit that lasted nearly 20 years for that. If Sears kind of play, downplayed it as, uh, you know, we're not really sure if this is going to be that big of a deal. We'll buy it. Maybe we'll use it, whatever. Um, <laughs> and the second that they had that, boom, they dumped this. And I think that what we're seeing from 1967 through 1969 Sears catalogs is that they're, they're just liquidating the stock. I, I'm sure that in you know, 1966, or maybe a little bit even before that, they're, as, as they're phasing out the butterfly selector ratchet, they're preparing for the logical next step right here. They're producing these ratchets. They get that quick release patent. Okay, mission accomplished, we're, we're done, we're done. Start, start boring the ratchet, start reinforcing it if you have to, to get us to this instead of that. And I think that, like I said, I think those three years that these were offered were just solely to liquidate the commitment that they already had made to these ratchets. Because once 1970 hits, you don't see these anywhere. There's no longer any kind of mention of, you can buy this ratchet but without quick release. There's nothing like that mentioned at all. Now, if you'd like to read more about this particular set, I've got a thread on Garage Journal and Garage Gazette. I call it Craftsman's Lost Ratchet History, the Intermediate Ratchets. Feel free to go ahead and check check that out. Uh, We'll go ahead and do a teardown video for these where I'm going to go ahead and describe the differences between the generation after this and the set that came before it. Just so that you can see some of the physical differences. Some of them are big, obviously. Some of them are smaller. But you can see the process in play. More Draft Forge is learning from the past and they're trying to make it better so that they can keep their contract with Sears and offer a better product for the consumer. So it's an, it's an evolution and that's why I gave these certain time designations, Gen 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. Just so that we can appreciate what was brought into the foray. An interesting thing about these is that unlike, like I said before, unlike the quick release ratchets, they just say forged in the USA. There's no specialized part number printed on any one of these. They all say the same thing, forged in the USA. Whereas with the quick release, we start to move into that era where it's going to say forged in the USA. Initially, they didn't have the part numbers on there, but they're moving into it. As uh, 1967 passes onward, you'll start to see that. If you would like to read something kind of interesting it's it's a it's a nice idea but unfortunately it was a little bit incorrect was if you want to do a a read an interesting theory about these ratchets um, it's called Craftsman Ratchet Trivia go ahead and google that or use your favorite web browser for that and you'll find a Garage Gazette thread about uh, another craftsman collector thinking or asking members of the forum what the rarest craftsman ratchet is and this ratchet is depicted unfortunately that thread was incorrect and their source and the reason for that is that these are very very intelligent people they they definitely know their tools on these threads um, but the source by which they were referring to for this ratchet because this is kind of weird was wrong and by extension they were wrong and the only reason why I figured it out in the first place 
was that because of that thread, realistically, that thread is what got me interested, even more motivated, I should say, to, to collect these ratchets and examine them. Um, I'll talk about why I got interested in collecting crafts and ratchets in the first place in, in the conclusion video. But, yeah, that thread made me think, huh, you know, there's, there's a really rare crafts and ratchet out there, and it might be this one? I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. And they they believed that it was only offered in 1959. It 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 wasn't. It, it's not. They were mistaking this to be a long lever um, breaker bar, um, 15 inch breaker bar ratchet. So nope. This was offered in 1967, um, and the evolution is very clear. We'll go ahead and talk more about that during the teardown video. But yes, I mean, realistically, in comparison to other crafts and ratchets, were, were these as rare as what that thread might suggest? Perhaps. Realistically, I, I do find, you know, quarter inch on, on eBay every once in a while. Uh, sometimes the three eighths. Half inch, not so much. <laughs> Uh, I did have one beforehand that I, if you if you refer to that Craftsman Lost Ratchet History thread, you'll find that I use this as a reference point. Look at this thing. This thing is roached. It's got a big old dent here. The gear is frozen to the retention disc. Yeah, that's in bad shape. This uh, was <laughs> like ten dollars, um, and it was from a junkyard. So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I wanted to offer a, a cosmetically nicer piece for us to talk about here, but a half inch I see very, very rarely, as well as the uh, flex heads and, and this. I mean, this would be probably the rarest half inch drive, 15 inch breaker bar ratchet within the Craftsman family, realistically. So, that's, that's all I've got in regards to the, the intermediates. I didn't necessarily discover them. They already existed. I'm just formally acknowledging their existence. And I, I'm happy that I could. It, it wasn't something that I was able to do on my own. Of course, those that came before me and, and did the homework and talked about the possibilities on threads were were a great inspiration and a great help for me. Those that talked with me about it uh, certainly were a big help too. So I'm very, very happy to to talk to you about these because they're, they're, they fall into the black hole, <laughs> essentially within the, the Craftsman timeline. What What is necessarily going on here? You know, I think we have it pretty well solved, but they had a very, very, very brief offering period much like the long lever and I mean who knows realistically I mean sure these may have had a three-year life cycle within the the Sears catalog but I mean quick release was a big deal how many people realistically bought these how many were there in the first place uh, perhaps there wasn't a lot and Sears just put them in the catalog to try and lick you know acquire what they could and move on. So, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a distinct probability that these, in terms of being a complete family, very well may be the rarest post-World War II Craftsman Ratchets to date. Post-World War II. I'm not talking about <laughs> World War II and below. I'm just saying the more modern era. It's, it's very likely that's, that this entire family fits within that that slot and gets the crown for that. So, uh, thanks a lot guys. I know that this was this was a, a longer video, but I, I hope that you enjoy this. This, this realistically is something that I, I took a little bit of pride in. Not necessarily because, you know, I, I did anything overly special, but hey, it's kind of cool to, to point something out that nobody else may have known about, so. There you have it. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. Keep your eyes peeled for the intermediates.